what we've been doing is keeping a record of attendance at these um, collection seminars. And as most of you will know, uh, we've been asking afterwards what uh, our attendance, our attendees feel about the, the events. And first of all, it's been almost universally positive. And secondly, not only are we getting a good audience for the seminars themselves, but for example, Frank Walton's uh, seminar on um, which, which, which listed, which, which started the, uh, the program has had 160 plus views since the event. So we're not only getting a good audience for the events, but we're getting a good audience after the events. So moving on, first of all, welcome. And I'm very pleased to see everybody. Secondly, some housekeeping issues. Uh, the first thing is, if you want to ask questions, please use the chat button at the bottom of the screen. So if you join us with questions or you want to ask questions, use the chat button at the bottom and we'll assemble them and answer them at the end of the presentation. The event will finish at about three o'clock. Um, so after the presentation itself, which is 35 minutes or so, there'll be questions at three o'clock. We'll take a pause so that those of you who have to go to work or have got other events on can leave and then we'll continue until we run out of uh, energy. Can I ask you please to remain muted unless we unmute you and can you turn off your mobile phones, grandfather clocks, radios, alarm clocks and everything else please. Uh, very, very disruptive. Um, I'd like to introduce Kim Stuckey and uh, Mike Roberts, who are presenting uh, to us this afternoon on the archive in the Falklands Islands. So um, if we can move on now to the presentation, Mike, I'd be grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, it's uh, Kim talking here. Uh, Mike's going to pick up uh, about halfway through the presentation. Uh, this presentation will look at the history of the Jane Cameron National Archives in Port Stanley, Falkland Islands, and the facilities uh, available there both in person and on the internet to research philatelic and social history. We'll also look at briefly at some other research facilities in the islands, including the museum and post office. The archives tell the story of two remarkable women. Uh, the first is uh, Tansy Bishop, who's the current national archivist, and the government archivist from 1989 until 2009, Jane Cameron. I asked Tansy about the role of the National Archives in the Falkland Islands, and her words, I think, are very pertinent to some of the events taking place around the world today thinking about the sensitive political and territorial issues that continue to exist around the Falklands. Tansy said, uh, the archives are a vital part of the cultural heritage of the Falkland Islands. Social cohesiveness and a sense of identity are an important part of a modern democratic society. And democracy can only exist in a country if people can access their history freely. This can be achieved by ensuring that information and access to it applies to all users, regardless of the nationality, status or beliefs. The vision for the National Archives in the Falklands is a facility that ensures the long term survival uh, and easy accessibility of those records that are most important to the history and administration of the Falkland Islands. This contributes towards self-determination and the continuing development of internal self-government. So that's the vision for the National Archives there. All this can be best summed up in a quote from Jane Cameron's brother Donald in 2010 as a memorial to her after her untimely death. Uh, she actually died in a car crash doing some research in Patagonia. And her brother said, an archivist is part of the glue that holds the community together. Next slide, please, Mike. Now, the story of the National Archives can't be, uh, can't be told without mention of Jane Cameron. She was born in 
in the <laughs> islands at Port Saint. Yep. Where's the next? It's slide? not uh, responding to. Um, Want me to take over? Yes. Okay, just give me a second then. I can stop and start again if it's any help. Okay, let me just... Yeah, OK. Uh, so everyone's OK, can see that hopefully. Yeah. Uh, just, yes. yeah, just to mention, it's not the easiest archives to visit, which might be a slightly obvious. Um, the way you can get there is you actually take an MOD flight from RAF Bryce Norton, and that has a stopover and refuel at Ascension Island. So there's two legs that take about eight, uh, eight hours each and total 8,000 miles. Um, you can actually have delays in your flights as well because there's wind shear issues at Mount Pleasant Airport, uh, not the sorting office in North London, but Mount Pleasant in the Falkland Islands, and that can delay flights. The other problem at the moment is the Ascension refuelling halfway down is currently inoperable because uh, the runway needs repair by the Americans who lease the uh, runway. So currently the, the aircraft are refuelling at the Cape Verde Islands. But you can also do commercial flights either via, via Land Chile or the Brazil and Latam uh, airline. Okay, next slide. Yeah, as I said, the, the archive story can't be told without mention of Jane. Uh, she was born in Port San Carlos in the Falkland Islands in 1950. And after schooling at home, she attended uh, boarding school in the UK, which is a common form of education for many islanders. She studied modern history at the University of uh, East Anglia uh, and on graduating devoted herself to paper conservation and bookbinding. She was apprenticed to bookbinder Sidney Cockrell at uh, Grantchester. Uh, she then, after her apprenticeship, moved to the conservation department of Bodleian Library in Oxford and she was there for six years. Uh, the ex-governor, uh, uh, Sir Cosmo Hasgard, met her there in Oxford and wrote... Together with three other dedicated young ladies, she was restoring most delicately the fragile pages of ancient books. Some of the pages were gossamer thin. I was amazed that they could be, so to speak, brought back to life. Jane's enthusiasm for this work was uh, self-evident. Now, after the Bodleian, she took a break from uh, academic life and spent time working in London places like uh, Pizza Express and the Hard Rock Cafe. And during the 1982 conflict, she joined her brother and sister, uh, Alistair and Suki, who were among the volunteers at the Falkland Islands Government Office in London. Now, her brother, Alistair, moved back to the islands in 1983 and finally persuaded her with his encouragement for her to go back down south and go back to the uh, uh, islands permanently in 1989. Next slide. Yeah, in uh, 1989, Jane began preservation work of some of the most de badly damaged material in the government registrar's office. And the following year, she was appointed government archivist, the first full-time person to uh, hold the post. Now, Jane described the state of records uh, as she found them. The, the papers were all heaped up in a building a wooden building near the public jetty where Argentine troops had uh, dossed down during the uh, conflict. The records was at serious risk, as you could imagine, from fire. And her fear of this was so great, she, she regularly got up in the middle of the night to drive down there, check the building was still there. And it was not until 1996 that funding was found to start construction of a proper archives building. Now, for a workshop, she had an old military porter cabin, uh, which was uh, set up next to the, the, the building there. The Falklands author and photographer Tony Chater, in a memoir published in April 2010, describes a meeting with Jane 
1991. I'll read the words here. One wintry afternoon, seeing her pale face framed by a dusty window, I popped into the ex-military porter cabin, which she rather quaintly referred to as the workshop. It was far cried from the palatial archives building we know today. The tatty floor was awash with photographs. Perched in the middle of it sat Jane, tapping at the keys of her typewriter. The temperature inside the porter cabin was almost tropical, yet she still wore a heavy sweater under a moth-eaten brown jacket, scarcely worthy of an Oxfam shop. I always feel the cold, Jay, she explained with a twinkle in her eye. Jane's world was one of sepia albums, used coffee cups, and handwritten dispatches bound in leather. Her work was a tangled forest of family trees and rusting dwellings. She lived on a diet of punk rock and toast. We talked for half an hour before she stubbed out a menthol light and indicated it was time I left. Now before, can you help me bump start my rover? I don't know for any librarians, archivists and conservationists on this call whether this seems an idyllic project to be involved with or one too frightening for words. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, things improved and were uh, pick up dramatically in 1998 when the new archives building was completed close to the old museum. The fact that the councillors found funds for this where there are numerous other competing projects was a tribute to Jane's uh, determination and their high opinion and confidence in her capabilities. Now the this new building was purpose-built to meet the minimum standards of the National Archives standard for record repositories. It's freestanding and constructed from concrete block work on a concrete pad. All the windows are double glazed with UV filtering glass. There's a stack in there for holding the archive materials, which again is constructed from concrete block work, and there are no windows in that. Access is restricted to the staff only and kept locked at all times. The stack's controlled by a humidifier, which uh, turns the fan heaters on or off according to the readings and maintains humidity between 45 and 55%. As a backup, there's measurements and record, uh, which records, uh, records, sorry, simultaneously the conditions and changes to that atmosphere within the building. With the completion of the building, it was, became possible for researchers to work on the 160 years of records produced by the Falkland Islands government. And the fruits of this activity became apparent in a far higher and more detailed level of historical research in publications like the Falklands Island Journal and, for example, the Falklands Islands Philatelic Study Group work. Researchers came to the archives from Britain, Ireland, the continent of Europe and even Argentina. Uh, the archives also started to attract other collections of material other than uh, government activity, such as the Minutes Book of Stanley Cricket Club, the Order Book of Stanley's principal dressmaker in the 1940s. So history for Jane and Tansy was and is not limited to the sober documents of government. Next slide. Now in there, uh, and you can see Mike in there uh, in 2014, there's a reading room and office for the National Archivist. There is a conservation uh, area, a separate room known as, uh, still known as the workshop, which uh, where the bulk of the conservation work is done, restoring uh, the records up here. Now in November 2010, uh, the uh, archives were converted from being a government archives to a national archives. So the, it was a national archivist who was appointed in the form of Tansy. This has resulted in a large amount of corporate and private records being donated over the past 10 years. And the holdings now give a more complete history of the Falkland Islands. And there's also now a number of private donations also occurring because of the website which has been developed making people more aware of the role of the National Archives of the Falkland Islands. Next slide, please. Now, the first National Archivist, as I said, was Tansy Bishop, and uh, she had been acting government archivist since the tragic death of Jane Cameron 
She's pictured here again with Mike. As well as administration, promotion and conservation, the National Archivist also undertakes research for people, supports local organisations such as the Museum in Stanley, and also does work for the Museum in South Georgia as well, and provides advice on record retention and preservation for those that request it. Documents can be scanned uh, either by a Xerox Work Centre or BDM uh, Miniscan, shown here, and TANS is taken, undertaken the immense task and project of getting a mass of documents online will be the basis of our research this afternoon. Next slide, please. It's worth mentioning the other source of research and records in the island, which is the museum. It was form first formed in November 1909 by the wife of Governor Allardyce. Uh, it uh, displayed a wide range of items, some which actually really had no Falkland Islands connection whatsoever. But the museum did move and continue to expand, moved to the town hall, but most of the artefacts were lost in a major fire when the building was burnt to the ground on the 16th of April 1944. But it then continued and got set up again in the 1950s and moved it from various buildings uh, in 1987, it opened this building, which you can see here, which is called Brit Britannia House. It was a Brazilian prefabricated house that was constructed in 1981 and first was used for the Argentine airline, Lade, which, operates the air, which operated the air service between Argentina and Port Stanley at that time. At the end of the occupation, the building was given the name Britannia House and used by the various commanders of British forces until they moved out to Mount Pleasant Airport in 1985. So then it became the museum and, and moved and was officially opened in 1989 by the former governor of the Falklands, Rex Hunt. Mm. Now, as you can see, probably, Britannia House had two major issues. <clears throat> the first is the size and facilities for a, a modern museum where interactive displays are very, very important. And the second thing, not so visible here, is this is a good 20 minute walk from the centre of Stanley. So if you're a cruise ship coming in with passengers, it was very difficult for them to get to the museum. Now there was a site available in the historic dockyard in the middle of Stanley behind the post office. So next slide, please. So this is the site of the new museum uh, where it opened in September 2014. The role of the museum is to collect and care for the objects related to the islands and to make those collections available to the public. However, the National Museum and uh, Trust has involvement with other areas of Falklands heritage, such as the wrecks and hulks scattered around the islands and the cemeteries also around the islands. Uh, it promotes an obviously uh, awareness and enjoyment of the island's cultural and natural heritage <coughs> and works with schools. And if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, a couple of the galleries there. And this is a huge improvement, as you can imagine, on Britannia House. There's a maritime gallery there. And there's also an interactive gallery on the 1982 conflict. And there's also a similar one on Antarctic heritage as well. We move on to the next slide. There's a number of outbuildings, as you saw probably, around the museum, one of which is a print shop, one of which is a reproduction of the radio, telegraph and telephone exchange. And there's also a print, uh, sorry, a print shop, as I say, a wash house, a smithy and gear shed buildings as well. So there's a number of things for people to see at the museum. Next slide. Uh, the museum also holds the Falkland Islands National Stamp Collection, which was put together in 2010. The, the islands did not have a basic stamp collection. Uh, so we did some work in the study group with a number of donations and Stanley Gibbons helped with a couple of the most uh, valuable items. Uh, the 1928 provisional and the 1933 pound centenary donated those. And this collection was created in uh, honour of Island and Nut Cartmel, 
who in the end of the last century was the most well-known Falklands-based collector and corresponded with many study group members. Next slide. Uh, other resources for research include uh, the post office, and there's a picture of the vault there. A number of design proofs and other things were held in the post office, but they're gradually being transferred over to the archives for better indexing and conservation long term of those. So that's, that's taking place currently. The other thing I'd like to mention is a book that was published uh, originally in 2008, edited by former governor uh, David Tatum, the Dictionary of Falklands Biography. That has now become an online research facility with a number of new biographies and photographs, etc., added, and is great research for people who are doing work in the Falklands as well. Okay, next slide. And for both the archives and the museum, there's a Friends of the uh, Falkland Islands Museum and Archives. And that helps the museum and the archives with purchase of artifacts and equipments. <coughs> Examples of that, for example, a tea set of Falklands Goss China, various paintings, early paintings of Stanley, one of which I think you saw in the invite for, for this presentation today. And what you can see here, which is memorabilia and letters associated with Louis Bayon, who was born in the Falkland Islands, but represented Great Britain in the Olympic Games in 1908. If we move on to the next slide, Mike. Uh, he represented Great Britain at hockey in 1908, 1908 and won a gold medal. And his memorabilia was available for sale and was purchased for, for the museum. So uh, a wonderful uh, group, the, the friends of the museum and archives and have really helped uh, the, those two uh, organizations. If we go on to the next slide. <clears throat> now we're going to look in the rest of the presentation at some research that was done. I'm going to describe uh, one set of research that I did and then hand over to Mike. So this is in-person research uh, in the archives that I did actually back in 2010 and was published in a monograph in 2012. And it looked at the 60s issues of the Falkland Island stamps. And on the right hand side there, you can see rough designs for an issue on the centenary of Bishop Stirling, the first bishop of the Falkland Islands. And these were some rough proofs, uh, designs that were done in the islands and sent off to the Crown agents. Uh, next slide. That enabled uh, the design, which was designed by Gordon Drummond to be work, worked up. And here's an example of the sixpenny stamp here with the transparent overlay of the writing uh, that went on with the, with the value in Falkland Islands, etc. Next slide. <coughs> and also the other sort of things, there's another proof there, the Tupney value. There were bromides uh, that were sent down to the islands for review of the designs. And there were design proofs as well, uh, printed by the printers who were Format International at that time, who have a colourful background, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, but the, all this uh, archive uh, material is held in a file for that particular stamp issue in person in the archives and gives you an example of some of the material and colourful material that is there. I think with that, next slide, I'm handing over to Mike. Oh, sorry, just, just one more, sorry. <laughs> just one. <laughs> yeah, last one, honestly, this time. Uh, also, there's, there's really good documentation from the Crown agents uh, and letters going back the, the, to the islands. And th this shows how many stamps were shipped of each value down to the islands and how they were then sheet numbered as well, because the sheets that Crown agents kept for themselves didn't have a sheet number put on them, but the ones that went down to the islands did to help with uh, both with security and accountancy for the number of sheets that have been used. So there you see the shipping record for the, that set of stamps and also the sheet numbering. And that, I, with that, I really have finished and it's over to Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, 
I'm going to move on to what we call in case study two, which are two examples of research which I carried out to do with um, maritime matters. Um, for those of you who have been to the islands, are probably on a cruise ship, uh, one of the most uh, iconic images in the harbour in Stanley is the Lady Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> she came to grief in March 1913, having hit a reef before she got into the, the harbour. But she really was, um, although <clears throat> there was an argument about whether or not she was seaworthy, she was damaged, but could have been repaired. And there, were, there followed an argument about how much it would cost. But within the islands, um, you have the interests of the Falkland Island Company um, and the agents at Lloyd's from L Lloyd's of London. Um, following, shall we say, detailed negotiations, the Falkland Island Company acquired not only the ship, but, uh, but her cargo. And we uncovered um, some interesting wireless telegrams between Stanley and London, asking all sorts of questions um, during these negotiations. That is an example of the, one of those telegrams, which was in code. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, we can see the, uh, there was an agreement to buy the ship and the cargo for £2,000. And on the right hand side, we uncovered the code so that we understood what was going on between the Falkland Island Company in London and the Falkland Island Company in Stanley. Next slide. Now, one of the interesting uh, ships that I studied was the Vicar of Bray. Now, I only happened to do this because um, I'd visited the islands before and I knew what the Vicar of Bray was and where she come from basically um, and the most in interesting thing about her I think is that she was one of the 700 odd ships which went to the gold rush in San Francisco in 1849 so she was an original 49er. Um, I don't know how many of these still exist but there can't be many I should think probably um, <clears throat> less than less than half a dozen. Now, during my um, discussions with various dealers, um, I came across a ship letter, which is headed per the Vicar of Bray, which I quickly acquired, we've gone. Hello? Yeah, sorry. I can't see anything. Yeah, we've lost the video, Mike. Now, oh, they're out. Okay, now. I've got it back. Can you all see it again? Yes, yes Mike. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, as, as I said, she was a 49er. I acquired this, this um, letter, and she was actually active for quite a long time for a ship of that vintage. And in 1870, on a voyage um, round the Horn, she put into Stanley in a damaged state and was condemned. And again, she was bought by the Falkland Island Company and she was ultimately towed to Goose Green with a cargo of coal. And there she remains. Um, and it was that that when I visited Goose Green first in 1999, that I remember her. She's, she's the pierhead at the end of, um, at the, at the, end of the, the jetty. And if you go on to the next slide, we can see that was what remained of her in 1999 on the left. And on the right is a landscape shot that I took in 2014. We'll now go on to another example of research. 
Now this um, was a, there's a whole study on its own um, and it revolves around the evacuation of children to camp. Now camp is the word, uh, campo is the word that's used for basically all the farm stations outside Stanley. This arose because of the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor in December 1941. And it was believed that, well, there was a great danger of the Japanese fleet coming around the Horn and using the Falkland Islands as a naval base for the South Atlantic. Um, both the national government and the Falkland Island government were convinced that this was a, a, a huge danger. And as a result of that, um, they decided to evacuate all the children from Stanley to camp. And it took place over a period of 10 or 15 days. There were several voyages. Um, and we were able to find out all the details of the voyages and the, uh, the background to the secret discussions which had taken place between the Falkland Island Council and Her Majesty's Government back in London. Those are some of the examples of um, the documents that I photographed when I was there in 2014. Next slide. And as part of that, um, included in the archive, were some interesting sketches um, and other memorabilia about you know, how the children were occupied and entertained at the, in the various farm stations. There's a Walker Creek song there on the left and on the right is um, a sketch of David Earle who was one of the children who had been evacuated from Stanley. Now, from a postal history point of view, if we go on to the next slide, one of the most interesting things as a postal historian was that if you were an evacuee, you were entitled to write back to your parents in Stanley and wouldn't be charged. There was, there was no postage charge, but you had to put on the top of right-hand corner of the envelope, evacuee. Now, I um, managed to identify eight covers um, and I wrote a monograph about it which is on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. It was a very full story that we were able to look at in the archive and had it not been for the archive it just wouldn't have been possible to, to put all this together. So we've got there um, some further interesting um, documents about how they accounted for everything. Um, and on the top right hand corner is one that the, the little lad whose picture you've just seen wrote back to his mother at the ship hotel in Stanley. Next slide. Now at this stage, if I can get all this right, I would like to introduce you to the online resource that we have available. So. This, for those of you who um, go online, um, this is a for free for everybody who's, who's, who takes an interest. And there are, it's a, I think, a very good, a very, very good resource. And it's grown over the years through the efforts of Tansy Bishop. And if we go and just see all, there's a, there's a number of different major topics, all of which are broken down. Um, and I'm just going to look at three of them. Now, if we can just... Uh, yeah. Remember I mentioned uh, the Vicar of Bray. Now, I've gone into the shipping register now. Um, now, if we go down here, just below halfway, on the 8th of October, 1870, there's a re the shipping record of the Vicar of Bray coming in from 
she was on her way to Valparaiso, by whom entered, for medical aid and repairs. So all this information is similar to that that you get in Lloyd's List. In fact, periodically, uh, the people who organised the records at that time sent these returns to Lloyd's List, and that's where they got the information from. So that's, that's one example. If we go back to, um, again, shipping registers, 1913. That doesn't appear to be working. Well, there it goes. Yep. All right. So in uh, October, sorry, March, it should be. The the Lady Elizabeth. That was the th the first one that I mentioned. There, it's about a third the way down. Thirteenth of March, nineteen thirteen, in distress. So those are two exam the, the two examples of the um, that relate to shipping. Now, go back here. Now, during our rehearsal for this, Chris King expressed an interest in the aliens. And I think I have here on 16. list of aliens residing in the Falkland Islands in 1867. And there are some interesting um, names if you, if you know about the Falklands and, and their history, because some of these people were given citizenship. Um, there are also, and this is interesting, I thought most interesting thing in here is that right at the bottom, in the West Falkland Islands, um, one of the islands, Keppel Island, um, is well known for the fact that it, it, it hosted the Patagonian mission. And that was partly, if you like, staff supported whatever, by um, South American native Indians, or as they're described here, Fujerians. Yep. Tierra del Fuego. Um, they were all part of the history um, of the islands at that time. And if we go back, there are some, uh, see Charles Williams, well he eventually became um, a wealthy um, landowner and businessman on the islands. Uh, Charles Hansen, that's uh, um, the Family goes back, I think, five or six generations, and they're still there. And they also give you details of, of how they got to the islands, um, on, on which, uh, which ship they came. Um, so that's just another example of, 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 of a resource which, you know, has been gradually added and added to and added to over the last uh, particularly five years or so. So, and I think that the last one I just wanted to show you was that this has been recently added. Um, uh, a tab for mail, stamps and telecommunications. And there, were, there are a couple of things here which is worth just looking at quickly. Some of you will know um, that there was a ship called the Afterglow. 1923, she was an old Admiralty drifter and she'd been bought by the, the um, government to act as a fishing protection, protection vessel effectively. 
And there was an argument about whether, well, it wasn't really an argument, it's a discussion about whether her master could be appointed as the male officer. Um, eventually, he was, and there were two forms of HMS Afterglow, HMS CS Afterglow um, councillors. The first is a single line, and the second one is a, a double ring oval. But this, these are the original documents um, which actually gave rise to that appointment. And there again, it's really an interesting thing, I think. And I think that the last one, um, because I noticed this the other day, and this is a new one to me, although I was aware that there was um, a provision for late, late fee letters, but last week was the first time I'd seen this. And this is a, an introduction to late fee letters. This is 1927. There'd been a previous sort of uh, agreed in principle much, much earlier than this. But um, basically, it goes into the, the problems of um, people turning up half an hour late to, to post a letter when the steam is about to leave and, uh, and say, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if they paid a penny extra and then you didn't... Uh, if you had to open the mailbag, there was something in it for everybody. So they did that. Um, whether or not we can find any examples following this, I don't know. But there we are. Um, so I would then... That really concludes uh, what I could say about the, um, the website. So I think at that stage, I'd like to stop sharing this. Um, and we have one more slide... because we think we're very proud of the fact that there's been a new issue of stamps um, and it commemorates the 50th anniversary of our study group. And there it is. So thank you very much. I'm sorry we had a little bit of trouble at the beginning, but I hope it's reasonably smooth and I hope I've got across and Kim's got across what we wanted to. So thank you very much. Right, let's, there we are. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Mike and um, Kim, for the fascinating and uh, entertaining presentation. And the glitch at the beginning just demonstrates that we were well prepared because we had a plan B. So <laughs> congratulations, Mike Hoffman, for inaugurating plan B, which I think this is the first time we've had to do. So, um, can we please now move to um, questions? I have a couple of questions here. Um, so, first of all, um, where are we? Yes. Is the National Stamp Collection complete and do they keep it up to date with new issues? Uh, yes, they do get new issues and it uh, is complete when it's handed over. But obviously it's a basic set, there's no postal history or anything like that. But it is complete for every stamp that was issued through to 2010. And then since then they've been receiving the new issues. I mean, do they have a development plan? I, I mean, this is a question for me. How are the archives, I'm just interested in this kind of thing. How are the archives managed? I mean, Tansy is the archivist, but um, yeah. how, how, how is the whole thing managed? Is there a lay committee or a government committee? There's a government committee. She reports into, I can't remember who the person is, and if someone does know, put it on the chat. But, yeah, she reports into the government, uh, and there's an overseeing uh, of what they do. I mean, interestingly enough, she's quite busy at the moment because the Falkland Islands Company gave all their records to the National Archives, and that is a very large amount of material as well. And when we were down there in 2014, it, some of it had just arrived and it basically filled the workshop up. Uh, so actually assimilating that amount of material. <coughs> and as I mentioned in the uh, 
presentation as well that the post office became uh, semi-privatised. It's Falkland uh, Postal Services now, FPS. Uh, and she decided at the time to take back and bring into the archives control some of the proofs, etc., that were in there. So there's a lot to be doing there as well. But I, I believe, Chris, it is up up into a, a committee of the of the national government there. But from a practical point of view, she's very much Ms. Archive, isn't she? She is the archive, basically. When yeah. you when you go there, um, that the, the book appears to stop with her. Indeed. Um, can I remind people, please, to to ask questions by uh, asking questions on the chat function. If you type your question. Uh, I will read them out. It's easier than trying to deal with raised hands and and so on. Um, two questions to get. Well, first, uh, questions are coming in now. So one from Gwyn Harris. Do they acquire the proofs and artwork for the new issues to run alongside the current new issues? That's a very good question. I don't know uh, what amount of transmission of material there is now between um uk and the islands actually before it was quite obvious it had to either be flown down or on a ship for approval so approval took quite a long time as you can imagine uh that some bromides or some proofs got sent down uh hopefully by air to montevideo and then on by a ship uh which would be calling perhaps twice a month at, at monte so it was very difficult then. I don't know now what, what is done. And obviously there's a, I think we're only up until about the early 1980s, mid 1980s now with what is available to the researchers uh, because of the rules, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a very good question. I don't know the answer, to be honest. I will ask. And so coming soon to a Zoom room near you is the answer to the question. Yeah. Um, um, a question about a question from Peter Coburn. I'll come back to the others in a moment. Um, as there are fewer than 3,000 people in the islands, how many local people use the archive and, and for that matter the museum? Well, I think we can only answer that by feel, really. Um, and I suspect the answer is not a lot. I think, the, from my experience, most of the visitors were from abroad. Most of them were off um, cruise, cruise boats and that sort of thing. But there will be, you know, there, there will be a limited number of, there are, there are one or two very, very interested local people I can think of, but not many by, I mean, probably you're talking about a dozen, that's all. Um, so, I mean, in, in relative terms, very few in terms of a percentage. I think Peter raises a very good question because we're really talking about, in UK terms, the National Archives and Museum for a large village, aren't we, in terms of population? Yeah. Uh, but of course, there is that overlay of a national government on top of it and all the legislature, legis uh, et cetera, that uh, is put together around that. Um, but I, I think, as Mike says, we probably only saw one or two locals in the archives when we've been there. And it probably is a number, you know, number less than 10 of people who might be that interested in research. I think it changes, obviously, with what the research is. Okay, thank you. I've got a question from Alexandra Di Sclafani. Um, how much archival information is prior to the war versus post the war when Britain became more interested in its colony? So I presume that means the 1982 war rather than the 1939 to 45 war. Well, I would have said that most of the archival information is prior to the 82 war. Wouldn't you, Kim? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's a vast amount. It's amazing. The islanders seem to have a propensity for keeping everything. It's unbelievable. <laughs> when you go around, I mean, you... For example, you find suitcases full of, of mo uh, modern covers and things like that that they've kept. They keep all their mail, for example. And I think that applied 
to the government as well. So apart from the major fires that took place, which destroyed material, uh, the Secretariat burnt down earlier as well. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 my, all the material, because also of time limits as well, tends to be pre-1982 that are there at the moment. We've got, got an observation from Robin Sherman who says he hadn't realised that over 80 mothers had been evacuated with the children. So no wonder there are so few evacuee covers from the children. <laughs> Because they were seeing mum for breakfast. <laughs> um, so there's no need to comment, it was just an observation, I think. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about the, the, the range of the Falkland Island Company archives, which are available online? No, not yet. Not yet. Now that material's gradually coming online. I think there is a tab now if we went to the website, but we, let's not do that now. But if you go to the website, I believe there is now a Falkland Islands Company uh, tab on there. But that work has only just started in the past two or three years or so of assimilating that material in. Thank you. Um, <laughs> right, very quick, there's lots just suddenly happened here. Um, Jeremy Jackman says, what can be done to improve the presentation of the stamp collection? It's only accessible in the standing position, no table or chair, not really a great experience. And then my, my, my addition to that is like the Chaplin collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, I, I, that's a matter really for the, for the museum, isn't it? Um, Hugh Osborne says that the museum is very active amongst the Falkland Islands children. Yeah. and hosts evening presentations for local population. And uh, he's given one of them on the subject of a postal history item associated with the 1939 Battle of the River Plate. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that, Chris, as well, that uh, there's, there's a magazine produced annually called the Falkland Islands Journal. And there is an Alistair Cameron, I think it is, history prize, where children actually do... Uh, historical research often on their families or where they live out in camp and I, I know they use the archives for that so there is a sort of ongoing process of the history of the islands and the islanders being weaved in uh, and and uh, a prize being given and, and people using the archives for that. There's another um, comment here from Jane Griffiths to everybody I oh, know sorry Richard Griffiths masquerading under the name of Jane. <laughs> uh, don't forget Daphne Gifford, circa 1977, was probably the first archivist sent from the UK, and the archives were in a locked room in the Secretariat, and getting access was more difficult than getting into GCHQ. <laughs> he also wrote an account of the USS Germantown. Um, so, I, from what it sounds here, the, the, it, it's really since the 70s that this has developed in terms of public, local and international access. Well, Richard is hiding his light under a bushel a bit there, Chris, in that he was down there in that time period as well, yes. teaching uh, ah. from the UK. So he, he, he could tell you some stories about life down there then. <laughs> Thank you. There Not all broadcastable. <laughs> no, he's got to say it sounds like a private gossip. <laughs> um, right. I don't... Oh, Mike Hoffman has pointed out the um, the HT, the, the uh, URL for the National Archives um, for the Falkland, and that's that's on the chat history. And um, Richard says he sent Jane Cameron copies of old photographs, circa nineteen hundred, um, in about two thousand six. And one house she was stumped by until she realised it was the house she was born in. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not sure that there are any further questions, um, except perhaps the, 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 the question that always puzzles me about any archive is what's missing, what are they looking for, and how are they going about finding it, but that's perhaps a bit long for this uh, meeting. So, if there are no further questions, we're exactly on time. You won't be able to hear the clock chiming three in my house, but it just did. Um, 
can I just make a few thank yous, please? Um, first of all, once again, thanks to Kim and Mike. Uh, this is an archive which is very far from most of us. And uh, we've, we've all, I think, learned something uh, today. So I'm truly grateful for that. And I think I speak for, for all. Um, the second thing is I want to say thank you to Nicola Davis. Nick has been working from home since the COVID-19 pandemic first caused us all to be in lockdown here in the United Kingdom, which is around about March the 15th or so, 16th. And so she's been working at home and she is tomorrow going on holiday. And she waited for a holiday until uh, this last in the series of seven uh, seminars had been uh, broadcast. So she's going home to Wales for two weeks and she promises to kill anybody who tries to contact her while she's on holiday. So she's she, a well-deserved rest. And I want to thank her again on behalf of the society and our audiences, which include quite a lot of non-society members uh, for putting the program together, for overseeing the program, for managing quite a lot of the back office um, elements of the program and for making what I think is a very successful prototype of a system of uh, non-presidential but society collections events that we will return to later in the year. So we will carry on doing this kind of uh, program um, and let's kind of watch this space. We will announce them in due course. I'd like to thank Mark Bailey for his <clears throat> contribution and what Beata my wife decided, uh, described at lunch today as being his family doctor approach to helping people through problems. Um, he's, he's been extremely patient in making things uh, happen for people who are uncertain about the program. And I'd like to thank Mike Hoffman enormously for hosting these, for providing us with uh, technical support. And without Mike and Mark and Nicola, we wouldn't have had this program to to enjoy. So thank you very much indeed um, to Nick, to Mike, to Mark, to our speakers and to our participants. And we will be announcing more of these in due course. So if you wish to leave now, it's three o'clock and it's the time we said we would finish. So um, in a moment, we'll throw the whole room open to everybody to have a chat. If you are uh, willing to stay and you have the enthusiasm to talk to, uh, to other people who are interested. So thank you very much indeed. Great, pro great project, super show, fantastic presentation, and thanks to everybody concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.